Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. I'm Jim Rugg. My name is Ed Piskor. And this is Wizard Magazine number 32, April 1994. Spawn and Batman on the world of two moons, Jimmy. What a cover. Not just Spawn and Batman, but Todd McFarlane drawing Spawn and Frank Miller drawing Batman. So it's Miller and McFarlane teaming up for that cover. Seven years since Batman, uh, since Frank Miller put, put pen to a Batman character, dude. And the evolution of his art has now gone to that Sin City place. And he's brought that aesthetic to Batman right there, man. Made the ears even smaller, <laughs> made him even stockier. And far cooler boots, man. God, the guy has the mar of treads. <laughs> well, we have to point out the multiple moons, right? Yes. Yes, for the K favors who haven't been keeping up. Just ridiculous. One moon, two moon. And when we teased this episode last week, uh, we took a very granular look at these moons, man. And, and uh, I came away to, with the conclusion that Todd McFarlane is the guy who inked two moons. On this piece, I've seen Frank Miller moons. I have Batman. Uh, I have, I've seen City a Dame to Kill for when Ava's standing against the moon. He does a Wally Wood moon. These are noodly Todd McFarlane moons. <laughs> well, thanks for getting down, doing the detective work for us, Ed. I did it so you don't have to. <laughs> well, let's dig in. Death Blow Goes Solo by Tim Sale. Yeah, any, any thoughts on Tim Sale? I'm a Tim Sale. I, I like his art. But I've never even thought in my wildest dreams that I would see him do kind of like a butch. I, I don't think of him as like hyper masculine kind of artist. But to see this intrigues me so. And to be honest, I think I might even have an issue with, uh, or two of this. I just haven't like looked at it in a million years. He had a big run. This was my introduction to Tim Sell was his Death Blow work. Ah, uh, mine, mine was Grundle. I think he drew Death Blow for like 20 issues or something. It's a big epic. Uh, it actually takes over on issue three. They have, you know, that he goes solo, but but Tim Sell actually starts on issue three. And like I said, first time I saw him, kind of continuing that style that, that Jim Lee had been doing that's a little bit Frank Miller-esque, uh, maybe a lot Frank Miller-esque. Um, yeah, Sale does a good job at it. Yeah, I, I always thought this looked really cool. Uh, Madman Comics, coming to, to Dark Horse, not yet, no evidence of it being a part of the Legend imprint, so I thought that that was no worries. Except for uh, Frank Miller, way keen. Like that there's an Alex Toth complimentary quote as yeah, well. Yeah, all, all Red was dope, and I just, I really wasn't in, into fandom at this point in time. I don't know what the dynamics were, but he was able to get I'm like guys like Frank Frazetta to draw trading cards for him. Chris Ware to draw trading cards. So he was like tied into these guys. I don't know if like he would take his comps and just like send them to the cartoonists that he loved or something. But I mean, amazing artists drew Madman at least once. Yeah, I wonder if he paid guys for that. He didn't pay them for the book collection that came out not too long ago because uh, I, I heard Chris Ware at, uh, at SPX talking about that. Interesting. <laughs> Letter from the publisher. I don't have a ton takeaway from this letter. Bigger office space? Is that what we're talking about? It here? is, yes. Yeah, the, the the machine is growing, and now they're they're into some good cash flow. So you have uh, two options, man. You could spend that money on uh, the business, or you could give it to the government. So they decided to opt for bigger digs. John Byrne starts off the uh, the first column, the first letter column. These things are... Uh, they're nonsense. This is very similar to the Peter David letter from last issue. Directed to Todd McFarlane, the ego column. And it's it's a pissing contest. It's a semantic arguments. It's um, you're living a good life if these are the ar arguments that you're having uh, in your day. Not to mention the fact that there's not an email address to be seen here. So, like, this thing has to be, like, <laughs> typed or handwritten. Addressed. Stamped. <laughs> put in the mail many steps have to be taken in order for this to be published in uh wizard magazine and john byrne took all of those steps so passionate guy to say the least i guess yeah they make a reference to uh this column is becoming like oh so in comics buyer's guide i think last episode we referenced blood and thunder from the comics journal <laughs> pros slinging mud at each other it's very uh embarrassing i don't have too much on the letters this issue I never, I never look at them. It, I always look, but nothing really stood out too much. 
Although I will, I'm, I'm glad I, I flipped to this. Where's Pitt? Thanks for your concern. We're gonna we're gonna have some fun Pitt stuff this issue. So this is the beginning of it. And the uh, usual fan art. Nice Beavis and Butthead. Nice Young Blood. All the fan artist stuff has just gotten to a very high level. Yeah, this book is out there in the wild, and people know that this is a place to get recognized. Uh, it's quite possible at this point in time, people have made some connections like, oh, Jeff Matsuda did some envelope art, and now he's drawing new men. Like, I better show and prove, because maybe Rob Liefeld will discover me. Yeah, they mentioned that somewhere. By the way, this Joker to me is the best Joker I've seen in comics since the killing joke, maybe. It's an outlaw comics Joker. Shooter to write Youngblood. So it was a, it was announced as like a rumor last issue, and now it's happening, sort of. Yes, and I wonder if this article, this piece right here, this expose right here, has anything to do with it actually not happening. Because Shooter is saying stuff like, yeah, I want this thing to benefit Defiant, and he keeps bringing up Defiant, Defiant. And I wonder if that kind of self-serving part of this kind of turned life out off or maybe it turned the other image partners off and they got in rob's ear i have a lot of speculation about this piece making it not happen i can't imagine that that's the reason it didn't happen but maybe well, mcfarlane when heroes uh, here's here's I have to unpack that since you since you take the other side. <laughs> Whenever Heroes Reborn comes along and there are image panels and, and Rob and Jim Lee are up there with McFarlane and those guys, whenever anybody would ask a question that was even a little bit towards the Marvel end, Todd would get up and be like, this is an image panel, blah, 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 blah. So I'm saying, especially when we talk about the ego column in this issue and how Todd says he holds sway over Liefeld and has influence on Liefeld. I don't know that he didn't say, hey, bud, this guy's in business for himself, bud. He's going to try to make money for Defiant, and this is Image. Well, it bums me out, because I always say Image and Valiant are early Image and Valiant are Alpha and Omega of Shooter's 80s Marvel. It would have been amazing to see those two things come together. Yeah. Things aren't looking good for comics now, dude. Innovation comics has closed their doors. It's over. Far far longer, like, this is, like, more like March to April issue or something. In December of the fiscal year of 93, they, they, they folded business. And it's not going to be the only kind of uh, casualty kind of of this issue. There, there, There's a lot of changes that are being made because of this post-image world, this post-speculator boom world, late books, all of that. A lot of it's right here in this news section. Uh, Marvel UK is out of the U.S., so not only is innovation out, but Marvel UK is no longer going to be uh, having books distributed in, in 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 our fair country. So that was that was a cup of coffee, if there ever was one, when it comes to our coverage at the very least. So there's a lot of Marvel UK books. Like I'll look them up because they were advertised so heavily that just never came out. Mm -hmm. And and Marvel UK existed in the UK for many years and had a happy business then they expanded quick tried to come to america we really weren't biting that stuff as 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 readers uh so they're scaling back and just doing business as they did before one other thing this is noteworthy hit it distributor strike back capital city one of the two big distributors at the time is instituting a fine policy uh if a if a publisher ships a book too late it's actually going to start fining those publishers for soliciting and not delivering in a timely fashion, um, which speaks to the struggles the market had at this time. And again, we're going to get to some stuff with Pitt later on this issue that, that will really illustrate that clearly. But this speaks to all the turmoil. You know, there were a lot of these large amount of capital that was tied up in books that were shipping very, very late or not at all. Darker Image, issues two to four never came out. Um, it's really tough, you know, on, on, on the retailers, again, is, is who's really having to shoulder all of this stuff. Yeah, and, and I mean, it's a, it's a trickle-down issue, like, where everybody's kind of getting effed up with these late books. Uh, you know, publishers are having trouble. Like, they have to book time on these printing presses, and if you forego, you have to, you have to put um, deposits down. 
you have to forego that deposit. Now a Marvel book is being printed and the rest of your stuff is getting screwed up. It's a big deal. They also mentioned that uh, Diamond is talk is probably going to do the same thing. Now, retailers out there, you leave, leave something in the comments. You could let us know if this happened or not. Uh, publishers, whoever, let us know. But it's capital on the forefront of this. And capital is not long for this world. Uh, there are many times and many things I could point to in the comics business where there is a consensus agreement amongst companies for different things. Sometimes it's price increase. Sometimes it's page number increase and stuff like that. Uh, usually the first to market, that's, that's General Custer going over the hill, getting filled up with arrows, and the person second in line makes adjustments. And sometimes that first person does a thing that nobody else does, and they get screwed. That was like Dale Goldkey increasing their price to 15 cents far before everybody increased to 12. That This could have hurt capital. I always say like um, anytime you do something the first time, and I, I'm thinking of it as like from an art production creative point of view, you give the first one away. Yeah. And then people pay you to do that thing again. So it's it's kind of a version of that. CIE acquires Moondogs. Moondogs was a long running comic book store and it says here, I think they had five stores located in the Chicago area. CIE apparently already owns several comic book stores. So after this acquire, once they acquire Moondogs, they then have 21 stores. Uh, I had a retailer recently talking about how comic book franchise, like franchise stores just have never worked. Um, we talk about stores a lot and how they have like a unique personality you know, part retailer, part location, all these different factors. So that may contribute to why we haven't seen a big chain of comic book retail stores. Um, but I think it's noteworthy because Moondogs was a very influential direct market, um, not just the store, but the guy that operated it. It's one of those stores that you will hear about a lot as you read through 80s uh, trade stuff. I think Moondogs was even brought up in that conversation with the retailers and the idea it, of franchising and been. stuff. Future of Image. Several issues ago, we made note of Jim Lee having this idea of skipping his books ahead. We've seen television shows will do that, skip ahead a season or whatever. Uh, so they're going to do that, and it's going to be Stormwatch, Brigade, Bloodstrike, and Supreme will all skip ahead to issue 25. I did not remember that uh, Stormwatch did this, but I remember seeing him mention it in an interview and saying, like, some people like that idea. <laughs> so uh, kind of neat. Uh, we'll probably cover those whenever they come out. I brought a couple of Penthouse magazines. Penthouse has been mentioned a couple of times. I came across these looking for something else, and I thought, well, I'll bring them because I don't know when else I would or how much coverage we'll get. I don't have the issue they're talking about, although this is number one from uh, 1995, so I think this would have been like a second volume, and you can see some of the names, Kevin McGuire, Jason Pearson. I'm not sure, Caragon, Car uh, probably a European artist, I think, Mark Texera and Dan Barry, um, some of the, the creators that are part of this. And you can see samples of what the artwork looks like here. These were very high production um, at the time and also paid very well. Guccione was free with the pocketbook for sure. That's, that's what all those guys say. So kind of a different, uh, some different comics of that time period. But we've seen them listed in Wizard a couple of times. So figured I'd bring those since I happened upon them. Ellison versus his enemies. Very weird piece right here. I don't know much about this time period, but it seems like Harlan Ellison was, I don't know, man. Piss and vinegar kind of guy. Yeah, uh, so this is, a, this is a group that has formed of people who have been wronged by Harlan Ellison. The guy who formed this says he was punched in the face by Harlan Ellison at some event. Gary Groth says he's part of the group, acknowledges it. Gary Groth, uh, Fanographics and Comics Journal publisher, is quoted in this as saying, you know, he's part of this uh, group. <laughs> I mean, Gary had to fight a lawsuit after a couple of things that, that uh, Harlan said, but Gary also chose to publish them. But I'm sure there was some other infractions. But that, that seems to be the kind of guy Harlan Ellison is. Just he, he would, uh, you get to know him long enough, man, you guys are going to butt heads at some point. This month in history, the uh, first Carl Barks duck story, 1943. Amazing. Pretty cool. Um, Young Blood number one, yeah, 1992. Yeah. Makes me wonder if 43, if uh, I don't know Bark's biography, but I wonder if he went to war. Uh, I wonder if he, you know, this is something he did coming back from World War II. I would guess no, because I think he was pretty old whenever he started doing this. Uh, he okay. had like 
10 careers, I think, before he got into drawing comics. One was a lumberjack at one point. It, it makes sense because of the richness of the material. Like, that's it's written by a person who has worldly experience. Yeah. Howard Stern versus Rush Limbaugh comic. This is by Boneyard Press. Everett Hart, I mean, uh, Hart Fisher. Yes. <laughs> Hart D. Fisher. Yes. Um, I just note it because it's, it's of the time. He's going to be a guy in the back page uh, biography thing in Future Wizard magazine uh, very shortly, I believe. And this looks like it could be advertising a television show right now for DC. I was thinking like a Cal- Calvin Klein underwear at the time. Like I remember Mark Wahlberg would have been in an ad campaign that looked very similar. Like a glowing finger. With that like sixth grade skater haircut that, that everybody had at this, this year. Not much in company news. The age problem. Letter from the editor, Patrick Daniel O'Neill, talking about the history of comics. This is where I would kind of learn about some of this stuff. Um, you know, t- time period and things before. So obviously, Golden Age, um, he talks about these periods between the ages. So like Golden Age, we all know, that's the rise of superheroes in yeah, the, in the ge- 30s, 40s. Generally associated with Action Comics 1, the first appearance of Superman. In line, yeah, exactly. Um, Silver Age, some discrepancy there, but usually I, I think of it as when The Flash shows up in Showcase number that's, four. That's usually what you read. Um, Mid-1950s. It's funny that that interregnum. Yeah. I, I've never seen that word before. I actually had to look it up, probably mispronouncing it. This is the time period of EC Comics. And, and it's kind of like a gap in the uh, history of comics, which tells for you a him. lot about how skewed. I think for general comics, like we forget everything was just superheroes. That was all yeah. of American comics at this time period. I know there were other things published, but mm-hmm. from a we're going to do a magazine about comics, it was just superheroes were, yeah. were basically the perspective. Especially when you're leaving out EC Comics. Um, and then he gets into, this is where he starts to get up on his high horse, the whatever age. Right. And, uh, like, that's so popular, like, like to, to kind of dismiss, like, the modern period. Like, yes. y- you always hear a lot of people say that. And and uh, I always kind of, like, abide by the Les Daniels Marvel book about the different ages. And they said, like, the Bronze Age begins with Conan number one. Uh, so it's like 71 or two or something like that. that. That's it. That seems fair enough. But you, you got to imagine like if you if there was a kayfabe timeline, maybe we should do an episode where we make one of those because like the direct market would ring in a new age. And I feel like that's how we would create the ages. Direct market would be a new age. Ninja Turtles would spark a new age. Man, now I want to do a whole episode on this because it's almost like Love and Rockets would, would we'll maybe that. be the beginning of that direct market age or something. Oh, man. We'll do that. 86 will be the start of another age. Good stuff, Ed. Yeah, like, we'll, we'll put a pin in that. Because we have uh, Spawn and Batman to talk about. We have real about. business here. So, the Dark Knights. This is the Batman-Spawn crossover, which seems to have materialized much faster in this reread than I remember at the time. Like, what a big moment, and I feel like it was only two months ago that it was first mentioned or something. Yeah, so, in the past, in the recent past, if you've been keeping up with our episodes... Uh, there was the Rob Liefeld and the Jim Lee Studios did a team up with Valiant Comics. So we heard Eric Larson talk about that that team up, that crossover last issue. Why weren't you a part of that, man? Because Valiant is corny. Valiant is garbage. And Todd McFarlane is saying the same thing here, man. Like, he wasn't inspired by Magnus Robot Fighter. Why would he have his Mickey Mouse, you know, his franchise character teamed up with Dr. Solar. That <laughs> shit ain't happening. So Todd, to me, Todd is an alpha dog. He is hard as hell. And he's going to he's gonna go try to kiss the prettiest girl in the room. If he's going to do a crossover, he's going to go with, he's going to start at the top and work his way down, man. So he starts at the top, realizes his value, man. And Batman is the character and they make that deal happen. Yeah, and early on, he brings Frank Miller in. So smart because putting money where the mouth is. Frank Miller hasn't touched Batman in seven years. You're, By far the hottest Batman guy this time period and possibly in history. When he when McFarlane is in his like little reality distortion field crunching the numbers, he's like, I'll spend X to make X because you are printing money with this union. He knows it. I'm sure it sells a gazillion. This is this is like to me wrestling dream matches. Totally, uh, really cool. And then like 
you talk about McFarlane's alpha status, he describes it as like, you know, DC gets to do a book and we get to do a book. And it's it's clearly in McFarlane's mind, it's a competition. I think he may even use the word competition oh, in here. And, and the DC guys know it too. They're like, oh, he's, he wants to trounce us. He wants to bury us. So the DC team is Doug Mensch and Chuck Dixon and Alan Grant, three writers. Did they I'm, end up with three writers? They did. I wonder if they could all uh, put a put a light bulb in a in a lamp <laughs> by themselves. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Klaus Jansen, of, of note to me is Klaus Jansen is doing the art, both the uh, line art and the color art. This is digitally colored, so probably over his his uh, his color guides. But uh, I like whenever we get to see Jansen doing color. He's a very very thoughtful artist. So this is the this is the this is the match. And in terms of production alone, like this is computer color for Marvel DC took years for them to catch up because Steve Olaf would be the pioneer. Yeah. And he has far more experience. These people, I, who knows who these guys are? This cover, dude, I fixated on this for yes. so long, dude. Just the interesting textures there, the beautiful lighting. Some reference to the Dark Knight Returns iconic cover number one with the lightning bolt and Batman. I may have seen this first. I may have seen this image first. I will not lie. This is the first comic. Like, Little Eddie P is firmly entrenched in comics and has discovered the comic shop at this point. So the question is, when school lunch costs a dollar, man, is Ed going to save a week's worth of school lunch? Because I starved for comic money uh, during during the school week. Is Ed going to pay $4 plus tax for this comic? The answer is yes, Jim. <laughs> How about this question? Did Ed, Ed regret starving for a week to get this comic? No, at the time, I, like, I totally loved it, man. Cool robots, like a Soviet threat, and it was all worth it for the splash page at the end there. Pretty cool to see McFarlane doing Batman at this point. Yeah. No doubt about it. Yeah, no, I was, I was all in for this. I actually read it last night. And for what it is, it's totally fine. Like I have, I have no problems with it. Uh, it's a, it's a silly, you know. It's like if we're you're gonna waste oxygen talking about the Expendables or something. Like uh, you, you might should you might want to know what you're going into before you check the thing out. You got to get to the splash though, with the with the batarang in the face. That's a pretty nice two pager. Yeah, like that's 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 gonna go for big money one day. There it is. <laughs> neon green blood so awesome with all the optics blood really good he sells the spatter pretty it's well it's great too when he goes back to spawn his face is sewed up with like a shoelace yeah it looks like a football <laughs> so it has meaning this is this is not a uh it's in canon right <laughs> <laughs> this is worth noting man. yes what are we looking at here ed two-page spread pinup by the great greg capullo who will be a premier, like, at this point in time where we're recording this thing, year 2019. He's a premier Batman artist. Yeah, really successful guy. Takes Around over. this time, would would come to spawn. Like, he did a couple of issues fill-in while Todd McFarlane's drawing this, this book, and then eventually would come on for a very long collaborative run where McFarlane was inking him. Uh, man, maybe 50 issues or something. Yeah. I actually have two more things to point out, like, within within this. One, he lightboxed that one panel from uh, Dark Knight Returns where, where it's Jim Gordon and Batman. So That's like an Easter egg. So there's that. And then this right here, I'll leave it up to you. S look real close at that and tell me what you see. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll save it for you. There's Zipatone on that. Did he use Zipatone anywhere else? No, this is from Akira. Wow. He's done that before in Spider-Man. Where That's he, amazing. Where he man. would just yeah, he would just take an Otomo background and put Spider Man over top of it. He's done it two or three times. And this is another this is another instance of that. That's incredible. I've never caught that before. Yeah. And now I almost have to go back through all of my uh Let's compare two page spreads. <laughs> so here's some some cool this is what you're coming for, right? The showdown, the fight between the two superheroes. Look at that shit. <laughs> <laughs> Different colors. Yeah, all the optics was just on point, man. You can't you can't fuck with Steve Olive. Oh, one other thing worth noting is uh, this this must have come out afterward or something because there's no moon. It makes me wonder if uh, well, there's one moon. Yeah, there's just one, one moon. moon. Yeah, yeah. It makes me wonder if uh, Todd got some fan mail, some feedback. 
That's real weird that there's two moons. <laughs> Forest for the trees. He was just sitting there noodling, having fun. So uh, a couple other notes that I pulled out of this article, and I, I'm not sure who mentioned it. It might just be because Doug Mensch is one of the writers, and I always associate him with 70s stuff. But a 70s version of Spawn would have been really cool, and I can picture it in that world of like Ghost Rider and Son of Satan and werewolf by night like it feels like that could be a really good setting for a spawn character totally because you know he would be fighting a giant muscular guy who has a head for that's an eyeball or something you know it'd be great and then uh they talk a little bit about their process and spawn number 11 that frank miller wrote he wrote from full script whereas this is working from a plot Mar and, marvel method yeah think? marvel method so i don't know if it makes too much of a difference but i bet it does thought it's uh, no, noteworthy. Knowing, knowing how McFarlane would write Spawn issues by just drawing a bunch of pages and m moving them around and stuff. But it was challenging for um, for Miller. But he has some experience with that, with like working with Sienkiewicz. I and... was going to say, like he's done enough collaborative stuff and he's talked about like rewriting scripts or, or you know revising them based on the art that comes in. Yeah. I wonder how quickly this was turned around. Because again, that's something that in hindsight seems really fast. There were three Spawn fill-in issues. This is 48 pages or so, 56 pages, something like that. Um, you know, so the equivalent of two and a half issues or so of a Spawn issue, which means he turned it around at a pretty pretty fast clip. Yeah, like everything you're laying down uh, as evidence right there or exhibits uh, suggests three months, three, three months of labor. So any closing thoughts on this team up, Ed? Not too much, but I will say that whenever I would see this Frank Miller stuff and everybody like sort of talking about like, oh, he's so great or whatever, and it might have even been on that first page. Um, no, like, but, but like it, the, you would see these images from Dark Knight Returns and they would be out of context and it made me think that the people talking about Dark Knight Returns were crazy. Like, what is that? Like, that coloring is weird. Is it color? There's color pencil on it. You hadn't read Dark Knight Returns at this point? No. Okay, gotcha. Interesting. But I, I'm sure I read it very, very soon after because I was like, it, I would be 12 here and I was 12 when I uh, first got it. So it was, this is early in the year and I probably got it for my birthday. So when I'm 13, maybe. I can remember being disappointed by this book because I was yeah. a huge Frank Miller fan. And, you know, they advertise it or they talk about it as this is Frank Miller writing Batman in his prime. Right. Batman year one, he's not sure what he's doing yet. Dark Knight Returns, he's an old man, so he's kind of out of it. But this is Batman in his prime by the great Batman writer Frank Miller. And I, I did not love it. Yeah. It, and it makes me like my takeaway is I don't know a good crossover. Like, don't do a it's crossover. Impossible. It's impossible. Like, like McFarlane went the furthest a crossover has ever gone where you see someone is kind of a winner and it's and it's batman like he allowed he sacrificed his character a little bit he let batman get the last word in and that is never allowed or done right he did not have to do this he could have had fucking spawn doing well i'm sure he couldn't have had spawn doing crazy things to batman but you get what i'm saying when they have these crossovers yeah. it always has to end baseline and that's garbage because you know it's going to be that way stupid Useless comics. If I were going to recommend a Batman crossover, Judgment on Gotham. This is a painted comic by Simon Bisley. It's a Judge Dredd crossover. It's pretty... I, I would take it over Batman Spawn. If I had to read them both, that's the one I would pick. Out of the Shadows. This is an interview with Jim Valentino, mostly about Shadowhawk. Yes. One of the Image founding fathers. My only note... On this whole interview... Yeah, I'm just looking close. Um, sorry, Keith. I'm just <laughs> staring very close because I'm like, oh, those are pants. He is wearing a Canadian tuxedo. <laughs> but, but continue. My only note is the normal man, Megaton man crossover also has Mr. Spook from Bean World and uh, Flaming Carrot. Did that comic come out? I don't know whether it did or not. I've added it to my list of things to look for, but uh, I don't have a lot from this interview. They ask him what's more important, the story or the art, and he answers that, you know, you have to have both. It just doesn't work without it, which kind of illustrates how stupid this question is that we've seen in almost every single issue of Wizard up to this point. Right. His plan is to do 20 issues of Shadowhawk. Uh, I don't know that he, he quite did that. Um, I don't think it hit those numbers. But you mentioned a long time ago there was that ad where the 1963 characters were going to show up in Shadowhawk. 
uh, they, they're talking about that here, and they're going to go back in time for any particular reason. Yeah, what's the reason, Ed? <laughs> I don't know, Jim. Like you, <laughs> you solicited the kayfabers for that comic, and I believe somebody sent it to you. So I'm wondering if you had a chance to read it, for one. And right. I'm wondering, two. Well, he, he's going back for three reasons. Okay. So uh, he's got information that AIDS may have been started in 1963. And so he's he, sick with the disease. So he's going to go back to stop it. And then the other reasons, he's also going to see Horace, a deity, and Johnny Beyond, who's a sorcerer. Well, Horace, Horace is a 1963 character. Is Johnny Beyond a... He is. He is. So I guess while he's back in 1963 solving this crisis, he's also going to check in with these guys. Hang out. I can see uh, Shadowhawk and Johnny Beyond being friends. It makes <laughs> sense when you're time traveling to stop in and say hello. Super weird. Very weird, man. <laughs> very, very weird. Uh, he talks about this character, J.P. Slaughter. Okay, here's another thing that, that comes out of this. All of his books so far through Image have shipped to the date on time. I think that's commendable and respectable. And he kind of talks about how Image is, you know, there, there's a lot that they've struggled to manage, a lot that they maybe didn't anticipate. He's an older guy. He was self-publishing before he went to Marvel, so he has some background from that side. So he kind of takes pride in, you know, getting these books out on time. And one of the upcoming titles is called J.P. Slaughter. So, like, I Googled that to figure this out. And that, that book never came out. It was a character that appeared in some anthologies that he did. But as far as I can tell, that book never materialized. In this article as well, this interview as well, Jim Valentino is cutting promos on the Deathmate tandem, the Deathmate crossover. Yeah. Intercompany politics, this kind of thing, that kind of thing. And, and I'm telling you, man, these dudes influenced Jim Shooter out of writing Youngblood comics. Rob, we need to get a hold of you. We need the scoop. We need the story, man. It's funny to think that. Maybe, oh, here's maybe a, it did. Here's another thing. So so this is 1994 uh, that this thing is being done. And he says, there's a there's a Shadowhawk video game for the Super Nintendo and Genesis. No, there's not. Like, that shit might have been in development, but the next generation of consoles is on on its way. And that clearly hit the uh, cutting room floor. But but I am pretty sure there were um, Shadowhawk skateboards, I, I seem to remember, at Hill's department store. And... Uh, those were really freaking cool. I, I, I definitely saw those before I saw uh, the Shadowhawk comic and, and wondered about the character. Thought it was just a really cool graphic. <laughs> and then he says, like, yeah, I get the thing about the violence with uh, Shadowhawk, <laughs> but, you know, his whole shtick, yeah, he breaks backs, but if you add them all up, <laughs> and all the issues that we put out so far, he only breaks, like, five spines. It's fine. Not that violent. <laughs> <laughs> five spinal breaks. <laughs> there's a um there's an ongoing thing that a lot of the image guys talk about and it's it's basically people taking shots at image mm -hmm. you know and usually it's critical of their writing or it's their shipping late or whatever and a lot of these image guys respond with this idea of how disappointed they are in their fellow creators because like one a lot of other creators benefit from what the image guys have done whether it's better creator ownership more options better royalty payments all of these things but also, like, the criticism started before the books even came out. Yeah. And I agree with that part. Like, what, what's up with all these? Because it was a lot of other creative, you know, fellow comics writers and artists that would level this criticism. And it did start from before any books came out. So, like, seriously, man. This is good stuff. This is good. I'm glad you brought this up. Because he lays it out. And he names names. And what we've discovered and it just even through letters and all that these this it's the seasoned jobbers jobbers the people that harlan ellison in the in the gary groth interview would describe as the writers who who can turn their stuff in on time not good you know not commendable they're just reliable and it's the peter davids it's the john burns john Byrne could draw four books in a month it's the peter davids but Jim Valentino's like, you know who isn't dissing us? Alan Moore, Frank Miller, Neil Gaiman, you know, Grant Morrison. The upper echelon see what's up, but the people kind of like on the lower rung. I'm not saying Burns on the low rung because that dude did very well for himself. But Peter David, I, I seen him at a show not too long ago. He was selling Xerox copies of old scripts. Yeah. Uh, these guys are the jealous guys of, you know, these younger 
kids like making good money, like uh, creating dynastic wealth. For, like they lay it out right there. Like we should benefit from our creations, not not some corporation. And they created dynastic wealth. Like all their kids' colleges are paid for. Maybe their grandkids' colleges are paid for from the work that they've done here in 1992. The interviewer asks him how Image works. This is a question that we've seen asked in several interviews with it's the Image been a while guys. Too. Um, it's it makes sense to me why they ask because this is totally strange. No other company runs this way, and and he tries to explain you know, that they're independent and there are a few things they vote on, but mostly you're running your own ship. But it is, it's bizarre, you know, yeah. in a world of publishing, like nothing like this really exists, especially on the success scale that that they're having. So kind of neat to see still everybody trying to wrap their head. They're two years in at this point and it's still sort of a mystery as to how do you guys do this? Jim, how does it work? Jim, I don't understand it <laughs> to this day. Like, you know, they point, out, they point out, you know, the, the money that Spawn brings in, Jim Valentino doesn't benefit from that. Presumably, the money that Walking Dead brings in, the founders don't benefit from that. But they're publishing far more books than they ever published. So something there's money, there's cash flow that's publishing books. But you see what I'm saying? It's very. I have no idea how that fucking company works. I'm glad it's they exist. It's a good point. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's. So we need wizard today to be asking these questions or the cartoonist kayfabe channel man let me get eric stevenson on the horn show us your books <laughs> drawing board i didn't recognize any names here i didn't dig too deep either so i don't know if there were any uh future pros that you saw on here neither did i but the noteworthy thing to me is you won't find a basic ass corporate lame kind of comic thing um, all by itself like amongst these things it's like the more interesting fringe kind of characters are being a samurai is yeah that. and also style wise you see everybody's sort of going for it as well yeah it's it's like i said earlier man they they really are upping this level that's a pretty great violator clown this is weird. This reminds me of like a 3D model or something. Like something isn't, I don't know how digital that is, but I have a feeling maybe all of it. Like clearly that's a photograph in the background, right? No, yeah, I have no idea. I was thinking airbrush, but you're probably... That's a funny crossover. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a funny one too with Batman. Whenever I saw this, it made me think like, was that going to be the uh, DC Batman crossover with, with this kind of stupid costume? Yeah, funny, funny how they make the classic <laughs> costume that people really give a shit about. Big babies. I don't understand. This is currently now my new leader in the clubhouse for stupid. Mm -hmm. Wizard yeah. has done a lot of dumb shit. Just because I follow, what is this? Just because I follow uh, Rob Liefeld on Instagram, I immediately know that that's him. <laughs> he posts a lot of his baby photos. Hunkin' Babe. Oh, wait. Nobody cares about that. Defiant weekly editorial meeting. Ed, did you read this? No, I didn't. David Lapham Art. And they're going through and they're talking about this uh, this uh, title that they're developing, and it is nuts. This is really strange. So they're working on this new title, and it's going to have vigilantes, and they're going through like, but we don't want to do like a Punisher kind of vigilante. And so they're breaking down what kind of vigilante they're doing, or they would want to do, or would be interesting. And it's people they want to punch on the subway. It's just really, really strange. And then these are the sketches of the characters. And it's drawn by Lapham. Just even down to the art, like, why would it be so thin? It, it, was it drawn five times the size that it was printed? Like, it must. This must be real drawings that have been reduced to fit onto the page or whatever. Oh, but see, this is yeah. Dogs of War, and it's these two guys. and Polly Dangerously. <laughs> totally. Pretty weird, man. What a weird ad. Kind of dig it. But it's... It's worth reading. He's very, like... Much more interesting than the baby's two-page spread. There were a couple of Jim Shooter Comics Journal covers uh, in the history of Comics Journal. They don't quite look like that, Jim Shooter. That's all I'm saying. Look, she had her purse snatched twice, so let's turn a vigilante on them. White-collar criminals do corporate pirates. This was the That era, feels man. like payback. That feels like possible valiant payback there, right? Corporate raiders. <laughs> Roots and Babes on style. Bart Sears, man, dropping science, dude. I don't have... So he breaks down some of his stories, and he talks about the different stylistic uh, stuff that he does in some of these different stories. Batman, Justice League, Valiant. I don't have too much to say about it. It makes sense to me conceptually. The examples don't give you a lot. You know, they're so tiny. There's not a lot there. I'll quote. 
let's take a look at different styles I've used for to draw comic books. And just like take a look at that. Does any of that look different? Yeah, it's or, hard to distinguishable register. from the next piece, man. We'll give some examples. So like one of them in Batman, he uses a lot more blacks, you know, shadows, solid blacks. Beyond that, it starts to get a little bit harder to discern. But here's the part that I enjoy. Yes. Yes. So let's dissect different rendering styles. And, and <laughs> this is ridiculous. Like, OK, let's just go with the giant muscular arm is what we're going to demonstrate all sure. these stylistic uh, options that you have. And then he breaks down different stuff. So this is like a John Byrne, Terry Austin. This is the Jim Lee, Scott Williams. Everybody look at that for a minute before I tell you what you're looking at. That's Mike Mignola. No. <laughs> no. Joe Kubert and uh, Sam Keith, Kelly Jones, Frazetta kind of stuff. I don't think these are particularly accurate. That's not too bad for a Jim Lee Scott Williams. That's kind of close. Like, like I see what he's going for there. I do, but the musculature is so different than the way Kubert would draw it. It's very weird to see it for on this sure. exact. It'd be great if each of these arms, like if the musculature were even approached differently because stylistically right. artists, you know, it's, it's your underdrawing. It's super important. So I find this very entertaining. I do, I do too. I, and it makes me think about how... Many of the professionals in comics, and uh, I'm saying even, you know, guys sort of on the fringe who do, like, licensed books for IDW or something, we'll say. They know, everybody Everybody knows how to draw, basically. Like, that you know where the stuff is. Right. And it's that finish where that separates the exciting people from the people you forget about in two seconds. It's the finish. It's that last little bit, like... We can draw a hand, and it, we know which, how big the knuckles are, like that there are three yeah. like different bones here. We know all that stuff, but there's a way to finish a piece that can make it sing or just kind of get lost in the shuffle, man. I agree with that, but it's not all of it. You know, like composition no. is huge. Like all of the stuff underneath that singing part, too, is, is equally important, and, and you sort of miss that in this example. But I do remember staring at this a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think about style, like right now I'm starting a book and it's like, how does it look? Yeah. How do you draw it? What is the style? You know, what fits the story? And so like this was would have been a piece, you know, the, you know, something that started me thinking about style and how, how that's part of the storytelling. Yeah. So we get over here and he, this is about starting up a kid's section. Uh, I guess more basic Brutes and Babes stuff and just runs a picture of the kid that wrote in a letter. There will be a future piece in Wizard Magazine, where they have one pencil drawing that many inkers do yeah. their finish over top, and then you really get to see kind of what Sears is trying to go for here. Gary Martin, a uh, longtime inker of Steve Rude, did a book on comic book inking. I think there might even be two volumes, mm -hmm. and they do that, where they have like Kevin Nolan and you know some very different inkers finishing a page of Steve Rude's pencils. There's just no reason for this. Yeah, I don't understand. It's real it. stupid. Weird issue, man, for that kind of thing. There's your Stormwatch 25 cover. This is great. This is like an eight fold fold out of R the. Uh, rip that thing out, Jimmy. For real? Yeah, go ahead. Will you put this on your wall then, your studio wall? I like to invite girls over. <laughs> Can't be putting that shit up there. I'm married. I could hang this in my room <laughs> next to my Stephen Platt wizard poster. Why can I not rip anything out on here? So it's right. just the pressure of the moment. Yes. Oh, that's hard as fuck. I would definitely put that up. <laughs> I didn't realize. I think it was your this. visitors will love it, Ed. Oh, that's going up. That's it's badass, right? Yeah, that's going up, man. There's a there'll be a Stephen Platt one coming up real soon. That's kind of the same same deal. Good shit. That's hard as hell, man. Your wizard's not worth as much now. I'm uh, got to crack some eggs to make the omelet. Cyberforce is back in an ongoing series. I thought Cyberforce was already up and running as an ongoing series, and thought they were like five issues in. I, I was kind of shocked to see this ad. Again, I have no good collection of time. You know something, Jim? The Hollywood Heroes feature has gotten demonstrably so much better in the past couple of issues. Like, Andy Mangles has really been stepping up his game. I'm very appreciative at the brevity of it. And he hits all the, all the fine points. Like, really quick, we're in, we're out, and then we move along. Well, the fine point here is... Fantastic Four movie, Roger Corman, shelved. We're not going to see this. Oh, wait, that's not written by Andy Mangles? Oh, Dave Galvin. Yeah, this guy's a good writer. Oh, what are you saying? Yeah, 
Uh, yeah, shelf shelf permanently, or is it? Because <laughs> you can. So you can find bootlegs at the uh, Pittsburgh Comic Con. Yes, sir. Lots of rumors on Star Wars coming up. It's going to be a while before any of these things actually make it to the screen. But man, there's always buzz about Star Wars. Yeah, there there was a great. Uh, to the toys that made us on Netflix had a Star Wars episode, and they theorized that that George Lucas made a terrible toy deal, and it was a very lucrative product. But the toy deal required that he get paid like ten thousand, ten grand a year, in order to keep the license. And then this moment, like that, lapsed. Like like they just forgot to give him ten grand one year, and he and he got the rights back. And started making a new Star Wars movie. Like that's when Episode One came out. He was able to make a new deal wow. with the toys, just because they forgot to pay the royalty one year. Yeah, so it's like he wanted to do new stuff, but he didn't want to make them money. Uh, it's a good good idea. I mean, you know, he didn't confirm it, but it's how it plays out in real life. The stuff that you can prove, it's how it plays out, man. This is a funny thing. Warner Brothers, a good source at Warner Brothers tells this guy that uh, they're considering a Lobo feature a la the Batman animated series. The opening of this article is about how the Batman... Yeah, it's going to be canceled like, somewhere around there. Yeah, so it, it's about how the Batman movie underperformed. Right. So. Oh, uh, the other noteworthy thing uh, is Phantom 2040, man. Peter Chung is going to be directing these these Phantom cartoons, you know, hot off the heels of, of Aeon Flux. Uh, and this might even be before the the talking Aeon Flux stuff. Um, it was in syndication here in Pittsburgh. Yeah, I saw maybe three or four episodes, but it was never on regularly. Like you could never ca- um, you could never count on being able to see it. But it was freaking awesome, dude. That's amazing. I had no idea. Um, I've never seen one of those and didn't realize Peter Chung was involved with it. So yeah, it's like right after the silent. I will stuff, check out. Right after the silent Aeon Flux is like he he did that and it's totally his work. But they had to you know turn out a million episodes, yeah. so it's it doesn't have the polish. Young Blood, CBS wants it to be less violent. So Rob Liefeld makes like a minute, two minutes, some short amount uh, of footage that he has commissioned. Yeah, like the animation company like comes to him with like a certain amount of time and then he is like oh yeah let's do this and so one of the networks that sees this and is interested is cbs but they want it to be less violent and uh he's not interested in cutting that yep holding it holding it tight man that's an amazing bad rock it's a good sequence like you could find uh that's pretty good you could you could find 20 seconds of that on on youtube logo for young blood was designed by uh Tom Morzakowski. Good to know because I saw a very old ad. I'm um, saying like in the mid '80s for it, and th- th- it had the same logo, and it was super strong. Oh no, no no! I mean the the animated the animated logo. Oh. Was designed by Tom Morzakowski. Oh, interesting. Just kind of cool. The good, the bad, and the ugly. A look ahead at DC's plans for its stable of Superman. Jim, I didn't read this. Me either. Let's skip it. <laughs> Wasn't interesting then. <laughs> Still not interesting. You know what's even less interesting? It's like they didn't even try. Still, his name is John Henry Irons. Yeah. That's terrible. Going to cross over with Milestone. I kind of remember that happening. Yeah, I don't. Marvel Man. Fabian Nicieza spills the beans on seven monthly books that he's writing at this time. Everything I said about the Harlan Ellison thing cutting promos on those writers who get their work in on time. It reminds me of this, this Saturday Night Live oral history book. Yeah. When Bill Murray is in a fight with Chevy Chase <laughs> and Bill Murray looks over at him and points to him and just says, medium talent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's uh, his books include X-Men, X-Force, New Warriors, Cable, Nomad, Night Thrasher, and Nova. And so he's cutting back um, Nomad is being canceled, and I think he's going to stop writing Cable. Cable is not fun. It's been going through artists, so Art Tebow started the first couple issues. Dwayne Turner is mentioned in here, and I didn't realize Dwayne Turner drew any Cable. I think he'd be a really good Cable artist, so I'm kind of curious to, to track those down. Uh, they had teased Stephen Platt in previous issues of Wizard. That never comes to pass. Derek so, Robinson does it, and he, he, does, he does good stuff. Interesting. So... 
anyway, he's going to be cutting back to, to the three big team books. And I mean, like, well, it's weird to me go, to see him doing go. X-Men because X-Men's, you know, described frequently here as this number one book. And it's just weird. Like, Claremont built that book. Like, it's, and it coasted with it's inertia. him and Scott Lobdell writing it, and everybody I know quit reading it then. Yeah, like these guys, because we're going to get into a Scott Lobdell thing, but Fabian and Scott Lobdell, the most charmed careers in the history of comics, right place, right time. I don't know what credentials put them into position to gain the trust of uh, Marvel to put them in that position. No fucking clue, but. They prospered from that. I mean, that's sort of all I could say about that. Now, in the post, Image Founding Fathers, like, you know, uh, like leaving Marvel, you had the guys come in trying to draw, like, with a Jim Lee kind of style. So you have a freaking Nova. Like, Nova should never look like this. That's a weird Nova. But I'm going to one-up you. Uh, like, go ahead. Amy, well, I, I was going to say, we covered Nicieza several issues ago. And where I first knew him was from New Warriors. I read New Warriors. I actually liked that book. I did too for a long time. Bagley was drawing it. I had nothing, you know, I just tried it as issue one and stuck with it, liked it. And that book went up in sales, which is super unusual. Like issue 14 sold more than issue one, according to this interview. But now it's been going down in sales. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's related to writing seven books a month? Like I maybe you're not saying. putting your best foot forward whenever you're, you know, you're overextended, right? Fuck, I mean, fuck all these guys who write a bunch of shit, man. Look at that speedball. Give me a <laughs> fucking break. Give me a break, man. Is that Derek Robertson, you think? He was drawing New Warriors at that time period, but I don't know if that's his It might not. have been, but that's such a corny thing. I that's think this trash. is Greg Capullo. Well, that's cool. I do like that. I mean, I picked this up off the stands in Walden Books. Couldn't wait to see how the marriage played out. And, and there's a sequence where they throw the um, garter belt, like the, or the, like that leg garter, and Gambit... Shoots all the guys away and makes sure he grabs it, man, because he wants to marry Rogue. So romantic. What is that? What is that crap, man? Planning of a, a future New Warriors X Force crossover, right? Night Thrasher looks like that. Looks like a football helmet or something. The first Night Thrasher costume I thought was just so cool, man. I, I like Night Thrasher. I would love to see you draw an old Night Thrasher. Like that, like that first uh, costume. New 94 Toy Biz X-Men figures. I don't have any notes on any of this, but the Ultraverse figure winners are fun to pull out. That rune is, nails it. If you look close, like you can see his mouth all distorted the way Barry Windsor Smith would draw that. Pretty impressive. Sludge looks like Sludge. These are great figures, except for Prime isn't right. Like yeah. that Prime... That's a He-Man figure, and I don't know where the head comes from, but the head's way too big. That's like a last action hero Schwarzenegger <laughs> head, man. And then the other homemade heroes. Gotta gotta love the pit. There's your Night Thrasher. I think that was a old costume, maybe. No, that's not very good. It looks like nah, it's not very good. <laughs> I one of the first uh Superman comics I had was drawn by Mike Mignola and had this character right there. I still don't know that character's name. But uh, oh, it's Banshee. But uh, he drew this character, and it was it was a cool issue, man. Like he, there was a lot of interesting panel composition stuff. Like like straight up, maybe one of my first dozen comics. Palmer's picks, mini comics, Maxi reads, part one. We come from mini comics. Where do we begin? Yes, for sure. Because these are these like you can't go back issue dive in hoping that you're gonna find. Any of the things that he's talking about here, like these are editions of maybe, you know, 500 at the most, but probably 100 or less. So one of the first guys he calls out is Matt Fiesel. And yes. we've talked about him a little bit. Um, Scott McCloud mentions him, you know, and, and he works with Scott McCloud. He works in the back of Zot. So I brought a couple of full-size comics. These are not mini comics, but this is Matt Fiesel's work. And so he was doing typically a one-page backup in Zot, but this one issue, he does the entire issue. And what he's known for are these stick figure kind of character designs. Yep. Very good cartoonist, very thoughtful cartoonist, and mostly known for his mini comics. So I thought I would share this. This is a bundle that I ordered from Not Available Comics. You can find his website online. This was like, I think it's like 10 bucks will get you every mini comic he currently has in print. That's pretty cool, right? 
a breakdown of, of what the, uh, you know, the differences in mini comics versus regular comics. And that's kind of what Tom Palmer talks about here. So he talks about how like there's very low barrier to entry because it's very inexpensive to produce these kinds of things. As you can see, you know, it's one or two pages of photocopies. They're, they're small, they're limited print runs. You know, you can print 20 of them. You could print one of them, I guess. Yeah. This is sort of the, uh, now with print on demand, I'll make a lot of zines this way because like you can just, you know, it, it doesn't matter if it costs 10 bucks to make one because you only have to make one. So Matt Fizell was kind of the uh, poster child for mini comics. And like I said, we've covered him a little bit in the past. Does these stick figures. Cynical Man's one of his major characters. Definitely worth uh, your time checking out if you're interested in mini comics and alternative comics. But I thought I would just bring some kind of my own various things that are related to mini comics. Because as you said, Ed, it is very hard to track down a mini comic from from 20 years ago, uh, 25 years ago, it's going to be tough. So here, another Eclipse publication, Giant Size Mini Comics. And this is, the idea is to have guys who typically did mini comics, Tim Corrigan um, would do like the small press, I don't know, zine catalog regularly. But the idea is to get mini comics artists and let them work on a bigger surface and let them reach a bigger audience you know, through direct market distribution that Eclipse Comics could offer. So each of these is an anthology. Each issue is edited by a different mini comics guy, and Matt Fizell does edit one issue. Do you know how many issues existed? Four. So I also just brought some noteworthy mini comics stuff to show off. This is the Mirage mini comics box set. We're going to do a bigger episode on just this. Like a, like a show-and-tell kind of gimmick. You know what? Maybe I won't pull them out then. You've all seen what mini-comics look like, and I'm going to show you a couple more. But here are the contents. So lots of people that you might expect from Mirage, guys like Kevin Eastman uh, and Peter Laird, but also um, Rick Veach, Michael Zuli, Mark Baudet, Steve Bissett. So pretty amazing set, and uh, we will unpack these in another episode in depth, but this floats around, and pretty cool example. Mini comics, one of the great things with them is because the stakes are so low, you can take chances, you could try different styles, because it's a smaller package, it's not like you've got to produce a whole book or graphic novel, you can just play around and have fun, you can do topics that are outside of the commercial mainstream. This is a, a mini comic that I made, Rambo 3.5, this actually won an Ignatz Award at SPX for Outstanding Mini Comic, and I made it to fill the gap between Rambo uh, 3 and 4. So it's half of it was produced in my sketchbook. You can see it's collaged together. It's just, it's, uh, it's, it's very free. Like I did this in a week after I finished up a project because it was an idea that I thought was kind of clever and very easy to execute. The End of the Fucking World. Charles Forsman's popular Netflix series started out as a mini comic. Yes, it did. So this is part one of that. This was something that I got from him in a subscription model. And the story's here. Like, it's really close story-wise to what ended up in the Netflix special. Interesting to see the, uh, the beginnings, but they work really well as storytelling vessels. Gloriana Comics. This is Super Monster number 14 by Kevin Heisinger. Bill Bushell, who we have interviewed on this station, talks about this as maybe the best mini-comic ever made. Hard to quantify that, but this is an amazing mini-comic. And it talk about non-commercial subject matter. This talks about a giant moon and how that moon looks different you know, from, from different angles and stuff. Why it looks bigger near the horizon than the top. And then, because you're doing a mini-comic, you can actually play with the format. So fold out insert, very, very cool. And yeah. this has been reprinted by Drawn and Quarterly in a more accessible, um, or at least more widely distributed format. So you can find this. And well worth seeking out. Kevin Heisig, and one of my favorite cartoonists. Uh, another favorite, Helen Joe's Gin and Jam. This is about two like middle school or high school girls getting in a fight with other girls from their high school. I just love the art and stuff. Yeah. This is a mini comic edition because the first printing sold out. So you make your own edition, you know, put it on nice paper. It's perfect. How about this one? Oh, yes, man. K. Faber, Tom Scioli's Satan Soldier comic. And again, with the color paper, like, I love this comic. I think the fluorescent paper really makes it and really makes these colors sing. Totally. And, and it's like such an adventurous kind of art style. It's crazy color. Uh, it was this, like, very weird, like, 
interim experiment that Tom was doing. He did it very quick. Yeah. I think it was going to... I think it comes from a supreme pitch. I think so, yeah, but a long way from that. Totally. He took it to a whole new place. <laughs> Minion Jack the Ripper. That, that's, this is a Tom stroke, for sure. I mean, what was that one comic called? Eight Opus. Oedipus. Say three times fast, you know? So... There's a lot of uh, a lot of ways that, that mini comics can be used. I have boxes of these things. Um, John Porcelino, King Cat Comics and Stories. He's kind of the patron saint of the mini comic format. Um, great cartoonist. He's been working, making these mini comics for over 20 years now. They're beautiful, but the format is really his chosen format. And like he's been reprinted and collected in books and stuff like that. But this is where a lot of his material appears for the first time. And spawned lots of people who kind of try to crib crib the style and stuff but i think uh you know like one of the things that mini comics do well is this kind of personal material because the stakes are low you know you can have a, a readership of a couple hundred really devout fans and be able to deliver this in a in a way that gives you a lot of creative and technical freedom to produce it and then i brought a couple of resources if you're interested in more mini comic stuff this is Mini Comics Revolution. This is a history of mini comics between 69 and 89 by Ohio's Bruce Chrislip. I met him at uh, Space, which was a small press show in Columbus. And half the freaking guys whose mini comics we just showed off. Matt Fiesel was a guy we bump into there. That Tim Corrigan yes. guy from that mini comics comic uh, from Eclipse that you showed off. Uh, all these guys are always at Space, at least 16 years ago. <laughs> yes, I have been there in a couple years, but... He, he would talk mini comics there. And then these are a couple of collections that Fanagraphics has put together in the last several years. And you can see this is the more true size of mini comics, the quarter size page. And these are kind of neat if you're interested in getting a, uh, I don't know about a consensus, but, you know, certainly like Theo Ellsworth, there's stuff in here that has won, uh, you know, won the SPX awards for mini comics, Lisa Hanawalt, um, I think Rambo's in, in here. Dan Zetwalk, who we've showcased on this channel. And then some of the older stuff from the 80s, which impossible to find any of this stuff. So kind of neat that these exist. And there's some interviews with some of the creators of mini comics talking about it. So I loved this Palmer's Picks. I love mini comics have been hugely influential to me, both in terms of seeing what comics can be, but also the stuff I was making and still continue to make. And, uh, Reading this article got me so excited for just like, thank you, Tom Palmer Jr. This kind of stuff was just huge for me, and I would not have found this stuff otherwise. I did not really encounter mini comics again for another six years whenever I started going to SPX myself. So this was huge. Like, this showed me a world I had no idea existed. Yeah, bless, bless Tom Palmer for kind of showing us the way. Uh, when I was picking this magazine up, it was really for this article. Um, there the 90s were such a wasteland when it comes to comics. Uh, the You know, the popular stuff were really people kind of... It was exploiting a, a, a boom. Uh, and But people were doing good work. And Tom Palmer separated wheat from chaff and every single month reliably... Except when he did uh, Hepcats. Um, <laughs> very... He had a good batting average, we'll say. Pointing us in directions, man, for like the legitimate good comics of the day that that we could uh, get our hands on, man, and and uh, I'm sure he helped sell those comics for these cartoonists, help give them careers. You know, I first heard of THB from uh, Palmer's Picks. I first heard of almost everything from this article, man, and I think that like uh, you know, we will continue at the very least to to cover the, all the Palmer's Picks. Uh, if these if this magazine starts getting real whack, well at least <laughs> when this magazine post, starts yeah, getting yeah, real yeah. whack, yeah yeah yeah, there were two clunky ass articles in this son of a bitch man. If when if, when it gets to five, we'll at least cover that Palmer's picks I think. And I'll point out you know like uh, Palmer pick alumni that have done mini comics: Chester Brown, Julie Doucette, Mark Martin, Jim Woodring, Peter Bag. So lots of cartoonist uh, work with these mini comics. Yeah, it's the it's the great first step. If you are real, you're doing this before the record contract, like like the great Nas says. So with that in mind, nobody's telling you you can't go to the Xerox machine and print off some freaking comics. Like when you submit stuff to an anthology and you get rejected, if that hurts your feelings, just quit comics. Just quit. If that 
if that emboldens you and tell and, and puts the battery in your back, like, nah, man, I'm making comics. Go make some freaking comics. You have nobody telling you not to do it. Can you go back real quick? Like, see, we're going to start getting into the weird uh, Madman cards and shit. You see, that's a, it's probably Dan Brereton, I think. It is, and I think right next to it is Art Adams doing Madman. Oh, yeah, 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 so it is. Yeah, so I guess those, those cards are going to come out. And if I remember correctly, I think there were two sets. 90 cards a piece or something like that. This is kind of dope because it's uh, you never see McFarlane using Zipatone. Yeah, that's a nice pool. It's a fun write-up, too. This is a deviation from he would always do those Spawn ads where it was like the Spawn logo and the number and maybe a writer's name or something. This is getting into the story, and the story is FBI, police mafia, and CIA are all chasing Spawn. So this is starting a kind of a big story. I think it's his return from Batman back to his focus on Spawn. He will have the football face. And stuff's about to uh, get get hot in New York City. This is These are the... X-Men cards, the Jim Lee cards that were promoted so much in that first, say, 10 issues of Wizard and stuff. And it's like, it's cool, right? It's like Jim Lee drawn Maverick and it's dynamic and awesome. And this is like X-Men season three. <laughs> now it's Greg Capullo and he's dope, but it's Siren breaking a glass of their voice. Like, get the <laughs> fuck out of here, man. <laughs> get the F out of here. Top 10 heroes and villains of the month. I don't know if anything's changed since last issue. I also, Gambit's got some hair going on there, man. Yeah, yeah. It, it, becomes, it becomes more and more abstract. It, it becomes it's a, It is like a game of telephone. Like, <laughs> Jim Lee drew it one way the first time, and then another guy drew it. And then, like, when Lee Weeks starts drawing it, it gets, it gets pretty Dude, crazy. Dude, what are any of these pictures? Now that I'm looking at all the character shots, that doesn't look like Wolverine. No. Batman and Spawn and Spider-Man are making faces. Prime's face is melted with his tongue hanging out, and that's a weird saber too. I'm sure they're doing it on purpose. I always did like the Mort of the Month though, and <laughs> Mort and, of the Month. And if this is the first one, I am kind of surprised that it's actually not D Man from Marvel Comics. I don't think this is the first one, and I don't think D Man was. Whenever no. <laughs> And have you ever seen this book or heard of this book? So it's, Comic Watch, Agent 30, number one. It's here because there's, I guess, a drawing by Stephen Platt. Oh, is it just a drawing? He doesn't He doesn't do... Uh... Well, these are like single-page drawings next to a page of text, I believe. K. Fabers, P.O. Box 3071. <laughs> oh, man. Munhall, Pennsylvania, 15120. Send us your Agent 30s. Uh, two copies, please. <laughs> oh, man. Careful what you wish for, Ed. I want to see that Stephen Platt early art. Yeah, I'm curious to see that, I suppose. But just the book itself is, is uh, I don't know, it feels like one that I should have seen in a million back issue bins. Because that, that is a very of-the-era pose. Make your envelope out to Ed Pisk or Carol Cortinus <laughs> Kayfabe. This is uh, first appearance of Nightwatch, Web of Spider-Man 99. Nightwatch is basically Spawn. I don't have one comic with Nightwatch in it, but... Um... Oh no, I'm confusing Death Watch with Night Watch. Never mind. I don't even know what this is. Wow. A lot of contests in here. All right, so picks from the Wizard's Hat. We've already looked at the Spawn and uh, Batman crossovers. Adventures of Cyclops and Phoenix, number one. Yeah, I picked this baby up right off the rack. Uh, it was... It was like, you know, in the in the bullpen bulletins and shit. And it, so, it sounded interesting. So we talked about Nisieze earlier, Tweedledee. Let's talk about Tweedledum's comic, Scott Lobdell, who wrote this issue. But it's really noteworthy for the Gene Ha artwork. This is the first time I remember Gene Ha's artwork. Same, same. And it looks very accomplished. Once again, Marvel, DC, doing their best to try to keep up with the production values of Image and kind of falling short because even the paper feels slighter than the image uh, glossy stock, but the computer coloring does not do much of a much justice to Gene Ha's art. And when you're looking through this, you I make note of like these kind of like cityscape structure pages because that that was really cool. But I'll just skip to the money shot real fast. Um, cause like, I always like this image and I think it's like a young baby cable. Right. That was, that was the reason for this book, I believe. Right. Just kind of explain how that all worked. And it's funny, like this was one of my very early comics. I read it. Can't tell you a damn thing about it. Like I revisited all this stuff to try to give it, um, some fairness 
once again, charmed career. What does Scott Lobdell have over, you know, Tom DeFalco or Bob Harris or whatever, but they get to have a career and make a lot of comics and zero memorable ones. We should say Gene Ha still uh, out there making noteworthy comics, by yeah. the way. I just saw him at ALA this summer. And I think I saw that he just celebrated his 50th birthday, and that it does not make sense. He ha he is very youthful. So Fabian, Scott Lobdell, a.k.a. the Mulkey Brothers <laughs> of, uh, of comics, man. <laughs> they do a lot of jobs, man, but never win a match. Kindred number one, art Brett by Booth. Brett Booth. Brett Booth. Profit number five. Oh, that's a heater. We looked at this last issue, last so we're not going to flip through it, but uh, <laughs> we should just do another <laughs> flip through. <laughs> like, that beef, like, like, see, we can talk about different things, like the beefy preacher. Kirby. That's Kirby? Isn't that Kirby? He has a holy Bible and looks... Is it, that That is right. Like, let's talk about Kirby. <laughs> because, because he cannot draw little people, man. He can't do it. Like, they're... God, there's so much ink on these pages. Yeah, it's awesome. Ooh, and this is when his hair got burnt off or yeah. something. Even his fetus has muscles. <laughs> 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 nah, see, that's a preacher. That's not Kirby, right? I swore that's Kirby. There can't be two guys that look like this in, in Prophet. Is his father Kirby? See, I that's Kirby. That's Kirby. That's oh, definitely man. Kirby. That is Kirby. Yeah. They're not both Kirby? No, nah, man, that's a preacher. If only this comic were readable. I know, right? Oh, come on, man. Where's, where is a good full-body Kirby? <laughs> it's it's got to be in here. See, that's definitely Kirby right there. It is, but I thought that was a flashback or flash forward. Yeah, maybe it is. Because a lot of stuff's happening. Is this World War II? <laughs> good. Ah, oh, man. Oh, well. There's no good Kirby body <laughs> shots in this one, man. But we'll, you know, Prophet, Prophet 6 will come out in months. I brought Rune 3. Since it's listed here, <laughs> I mentioned his mouth being all jacked, yeah. so there's a good look at it. But it's Ultraverse premiere number one, so first of all, let's subject you to some Barry Windsor Smith. Pretty crazy coloring on this stuff. Look at that yellow, they man. Just can't you don't see a lot out. of a lot of uh, comics that look quite like this. Barry Windsor Smith was just on for a while. Look at that. It's so weird. Yeah, it's like uh, part robot or something. I think that Rune is infected with something. This was unusual. This does not look like win typical Windsor Smith art. I've never seen uh, that kind of treatment, that finishing. Yeah. It looks like uh, Xerox big. Uh, they did stippling very small, and then Xerox yeah, it's possible. much bigger. It's so bizarre. Like, what's he even... E he's eating like a robot spine. That's how you do it. That's pretty dope. <laughs> It's great stuff. But the flip side is uh, Ultraverse Premiere number one, which I guess might be why this is listed here. And it previews a few of these different uh, different titles. And yeah, I, I, I know that we've been crushing on Ultraverse. This is a chance to actually see what some of this stuff looks like. Unremarkable, you know? I mean, that's a boring page. Yeah, it's terrible. That is a boring page. Someone should be in trouble for that. This is that Ho, Ho Win. I'm not sure from how you Q, pronounce his Q name. Unit? No, he's not from Q Unit. It's uh, Hong Hong Win. Um, he did some Punisher stuff, like Ward Zone, maybe. I kind of like his art, but I don't know of a distinct character run that he has. That looks like it came right off of Lobo's back it, number. It totally something is. Or other. It totally is. But I do like this guy's stuff. It's pretty extreme. Like he he's he's an outlaw artist, just uh, waiting for content that suits him. But man, these comics. <laughs> That's kind of crazy. So there's your spotlight book. I, I don't know if it's worthy of the spotlight or not. By the way, Hellboy Seed of Destruction, which we've also looked at, but it doesn't... This will, this will cleanse our eyes a little yeah. bit from, from looking at that Ultraverse. Does not get pulled out. So this is one that Wizard could do over again. Good color from the start. Yeah. I can remember somewhere or other he talk, talks about you know, like he's pretty involved in that. He has a distinct idea of what he wants. Man beautiful such a distinct book he really hit the ground running with this thing too i mean it's just vomiting forth all the stuff he was itching to draw for 20 years that no writer you once again you could wait for a writer to write something for you or you can make a thing you know and if you make a thing there's some danger you like you gotta nobody's gonna pay you for that 
you know? Like, you gotta make it and hope that you sell a bunch. It's, it's just, it's a monster comic. You know, like, it's a monster comic. Nobody does comics like that. Yeah. I also like that uh, Hellboy has no kryptonite, so all he does is kick ass. Little Art Adams in the back here. Might as well show that off while we're... <laughs> That's a great title page. Yeah, it is. Just to back up on this first miniseries run, but... Art Adams, man. Ooh, that's a monkey, man. You'll you'll see next issue. <laughs> Why is that woman's shirt ripped off? It's because it's Art Adams. He's all about the <laughs> TNA, man. Bone 13. I was going to call that one out. All right, so here we go. Pit number four. Do you remember when we saw Pit in uh, Wizard Magazine, Ed? It's been a hot minute. It's been 16 issues. Oh, geez. <laughs> Good and cheap. American flag one to three. Go ahead and extend that to one to twenty four. Absolutely. Because those are around. You can find those. And they're still good and cheap. Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Yeah, that's that that's great comics and, and definitely worth your time. So this is this is amazing to me. Top one hundred, what was hot one year ago, pit number four. <laughs> so talking that about sucks. like how how messed up, you know, if if you're a retailer, like that's a year that you ordered pit number fours a year ago. And they're just arriving, presumably now. I mean, I don't know if this is a guarantee that pit number four comes out this month, but definitely they thought it was coming out a year ago. Right. And and let's explain what is happening with these. Like, so a shop has phantom money that is like just waiting to be pulled from. No, I, I think they actually have to pay for that. I don't know if they pay in advance, but it's a budget. Like they have a certain amount of money that they can spend in a month, you know, if it's a responsible store. And this was the number fifth book. So a lot of stores spent a lot of money on this book that it, did not come out for a year. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah, it, it fucks up the whole equilibrium because now that store isn't buying something that is going to come out, you know, that next month. By the way, number three book on the list, Darker Image number two, never comes out. Right. So a year ago, two of your top five books that you paid for don't exist. You don't get to spend that money somewhere else. Right, yeah, that's 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 time is over. Um, they they took a spot from other titles. Bad look, like like that's the kind of thing that you see, and then you see people's arguments, uh, and and what you just laid out. That's all that like John Byrne had to say in his in any interview, or Peter David is like that's all you have to Here's say. Here's the problem with that, Ed. You can't say that before the first book ships, because yeah. who knows? Maybe they'll ship on time. No, yeah, of course, but I'm saying, like, there, there are interviews in these past couple yeah. of issues, and it's This is like, what they should be banging the drum on. Exactly. I, I, that part's pretty discouraging to see that, like... Because, I mean, it's it's one thing for us to talk about it now, but that's lots of dudes' livelihoods. We, like, like there are real people that I mean, get it hurt the crushed industry. over this. It hurt the industry. How many thousands of Love and Rockets comics didn't get uh, ordered because they had money earmarked for these Pit comics? And, and we saw an ad last issue for a Pit number four, and was like, whoa, man, like... I said something like, Keon's really like putting these things out way faster than I thought. Clearly not. He's clearly not. So here's another story that, that has revealed itself to me in reading these wizards. I thought Valiant was this hot company that, that really worked for a while. Yeah. And in rereading these, they're all speculation. In the beginning, nobody bought them, so then the back issues were worth a lot. But then they were good, right? No, they were never good. Right. So one year ago, we have Magnus Robot Fighter at number nine. And here we are one year later at 58. Like Valiant just, this is around their kind of their peak moment of sales. And I think that they just didn't sell. Like stores ordered these things. They didn't sell. And now they're not ordering them. One year later, Valiant's already out of the top 50. Yeah, yeah. They'll be uh, turned to acclaim comics in no time, I'm sure. <laughs> March 94, top 10. Look at Marvel's number one. We talked about this last issue, man. Yeah. Marvel's number one. Now Marvel's number two joins the list. We are burying the lead because our three, <laughs> count of three, Stephen Platt books on this motherfucker, man. I was very confused when I saw this because it's like, all right, first Stephen Platt. That makes sense. That's high up there. Third Stephen Platt. Second Stephen Platt. What's going on? This one has Spider-Man. And so Spider-Man, uh, Platt is sort of compared to Todd McFarlane around this time period. So I think seeing him on Spider-Man is, is why that one's ranked higher. It's even a beefy Spider-Man, too. <laughs> I encourage everybody. Well, actually, these comics are sought after and you can't get them cheap. But, uh, you know, I guess maybe you could go online and try to find, see what that Spider-Man looks like. Uh, it's very cool. 
You'll never see a Spider-Man like that again. Platt is risen in the ranks, too, in their top ten list. He's at five. Yeah, Wizard Market Watch. They, uh... <laughs> they, they talk about, you know, whatever's hot back issues and stuff. And so Ghost Rider and Punisher have, have cooled off. They have a case of spin-off-itis. So they're going down the charts. Yeah, uh, the New Mutants 87 is down to forty dollars in this Ooh. issue just a couple months ago 72 bucks man we did not get out at the right time on that one there is mention that uh the mike kaluta shadows are going up in value and i i assume it's uh movie speculation uh, uh, there'll be a shadow movie coming up and finally in the uh, golden age category an issue of detective comics or a copy of detective comics number 27 sold for roughly a hundred thousand dollars so it's kind of neat to see these these markers of where this stuff is at at the time. That's a, quite a penny, I think. Uh, probably surprising everybody. Surprising enough that it's noted here. Call out a shot of Jack Kirby. Always nice to see. Yeah, it looks like he and Frank Miller are in the, occupying the same space. Like It looks like it was taken at the same spot. The lighting is exactly the same. I hope they are. I hope they had a nice dinner afterwards. Yeah. Can we skip to the second best article, Jim? I'm trying, Ed. Ego, a Mustang by Todd McFarlane. Ego, of course, everyone's got opinions. This one is, uh, Todd McFarlane wants to be go in a more positive direction. So he's going to talk about his friendship with Rob Liefeld a polarizing figure in the comics industry at the time. This is a good piece, man. Second best article in Wizard Magazine. I love this article. It's real fun. Hearing the, the dynamics of their... They're basically friends, and, he, and he's talking about that friendship and how it started. Liefeld was a kind of hot, upcoming artist, and McFarlane had heard there was some guy aping his style. There's chatty patties out there who like to stir the pot. And people from Marvel were saying, hey, there's this kid over there in D.C. Dross kind of like you. <laughs> so he tells a story, Todd McFarlane tells a story about going over to the D.C. booth and kind of yelling at Rob Liefeld to come. He wants to have a word with him. And uh, everybody expecting that Todd McFarlane's going to give him hell for having a similar style or whatever. And then they walk off and become fast friends. And, and McFarlane says he loves what he's doing and uh, tells a story about San Diego um, Rob was just coming down for one night or whatever, so he stayed with him there and uh, laughing about different artwork, Flaming Carrot uh, ad in the San Diego program. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, they're doing that. They're talking all night, but there is Wendy McFarlane in the room too, <laughs> and she's just like, can we can I get some freaking sleep? <laughs> and then, uh, you know, they become friends like phone friends, right? A lot of guys talk about talking on the phone and inking at the time. So they're talking on the phone and... He says that Rob's calling him like every day. And finally, Todd says something about he calls him more than his mom does. And then he doesn't hear from him for two weeks. So then Todd has to call him and tell him, hey, I'm you know kidding around and, and got to learn I'm joking most of the time. But he tells the story about how like Rob would ask him about advice and stuff. You know, he's coming up as a hot young artist and Todd would give him like, well, this is what I would tell him. Stuff that he says he would never say himself, <laughs> right, but, but Rob goes off and says it, and uh, pretty amazing. Like, like it, it's very fun. It's cool to see. This is a little bit like road stories in wrestling for me. So, like reading about some of their experiences, making comics, talking to each other, traveling together. I dug all that. I did too, man. It's a good. It's a good piece. It's a good piece. And 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 Rob really is getting raked over the coals. And 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 it is funny too because there's no context for people. Like, and and it's this way today even just like very reactionary kind of uh stuff going on uh online and if you step back sometimes i mean rob layfield was a, was a kid he was a young kid like so it's presumably it could be people far older than him cold dissing him not only that but you don't know a person's story in a lot of ways and it's it's here so it can be talked about but uh rob supported his family uh, his his dad was very very sick, and he supported his family through through making comics. That's awesome. It is, and and he goes on McFarlane and says, "I'll go on the record and say Image Comics would not exist without Rob Liefeld." That's pretty bold praise right there. I mean, we were talking about it in earlier issues. Um, 
Youngblood number one was number one for a reason. It was Rob who was like going to go off and do this thing, and then everybody else kind of followed along. Maybe through his, those phone discussions, like he brings it up to, to Todd, and Todd Todd is being uh, a dad, like just not, he's out of the business for months at that point, and it's like, oh, I'll do that too. Super cool, man. And they share that dynamic throughout. Now they would have their ups and downs, no doubt. Uh, throughout the years but if you're being real with somebody that just happens naturally uh, but this past two, 2019 San Diego Comic Con there's a good interview with them on a yacht and they seem like they picked up where they left off things that seem pretty cool uh, Rob Liefeld was the creator of a character who's billion dollar franchise at this point for, for Marvel Todd well he at least created Venom because I don't know that that <laughs> movie became much of a thing but you know syncopation it's kind of cool there's also some mention of Harlan Ellison back here again. Well, the whole the whole impetus for for this piece is the Peter David. I mean, it's it's uh, my phone's cutting promos just with the whole the way the article was written because right. it's Peter David who's like on Ellison's side and 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 promoting like the virtues of Harlan Ellison when everybody else is dissing him or whatever. So like that's. The tact or whatever that that life out i mean that mcfarlane is taking with the article yeah i mentioned it because we had the ellison mm -hmm. letter in the beginning and it did make me wonder like is that editorial foresight that they would put that letter in the beginning because oh, right. it's kind of a nice bookend to an issue smart yeah you know it goes full circle yeah right. if, if, if if that is the case i'm gonna um take the chance and just give that props to uh, Jim McLaughlin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's 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 pretty impressive uh, because some up to this point, I feel like a lot of these wizards are sort of, I don't know, held together with bubble gum and duct tape and stuff like that. But uh, it seems like maybe part of the the move to the bigger office and the success the magazines had is that it is a little more cohesive editorial vision. Uh, that one being a very small detail. So. I like this article. I do it's too. It's pretty fun. And for those playing at home, uh, and if you were wondering, I believe that is a Jeff Matsuda Bad Rock uh, body right there. Wow. Good I, call. I could tell by those things. Those like little tick marks. That's a Jeff Matsuda piece if I've, if I've ever seen one. Well, now I need to know who's drawing that spawn because I don't think that's a McFarlane spawn. Yeah, I don't either, man. And and it's weird because like that kind of art, like uh, those kind of chicken scratch marks, I only see that in British comics. Huh. You know, I have, I only see that in, like, to, that's like Cam Kennedy type stuff, but I can't imagine Cam Kennedy was commissioned <laughs> to draw Spawn ever. It seems unlikely. <laughs> well, I guess the mystery will continue. Kay Faber will let us know for sure, man. They, they're, they're on the ball with that stuff. Life out in McFarlane, bestest pals. It's a beautiful piece right there. I mean, they, they should frame that image. And the wizard profile. So, uh, I'm going to read a couple of these answers as further evidence that these profiles are just not helping anybody. Like, like maybe we should cut this out, wizard. Yeah, you should. You do that, Jim, because I've said all I needed to say about Nelson. He gets no more Eddie P. Oxygen. All right, so here's a couple Q&As. What do you collect? I like to have things that interest me. I'm not really a collector, but if I have money in my pocket, I'll buy it. <laughs> Favorite television show, Get Smart, because it's so wonderfully goofy. Don Adams talking into his shoe. You gotta laugh at that stuff. I do like Get Smart, though. Yeah, nothing against Get Smart, but I don't know if you gotta laugh at him talking into his shoe. I would say, Wizard, do something better with this page. Yeah, I see, dude, I'm gonna tell you, like, I seem to remember liking this. And this would, have be, would be the place where I would see, I can't be misremembering this, but this would be the place where I would see, hey, 8-Ball, Acme Novelty Library, amongst like what people are reading now the people that they're going to start talking to it's going to be like paul dini and people who have a little bit more you know they have a little bit more going on than, than like nelson will say uh but i'm telling you like that's where i started to see these things like like it'll be funny to see if i'm just totally misremembering shit I just haven't seen any good ones yet. No, but, uh, no, all terrible. Even hey the Stanley I'll, I'll keep reading them, so we'll see. Right. <laughs> and that concludes Wizard number 32. Not a bad issue, man. For for uh, for the Miller McFarlane piece, if nothing else. Miller, McFarlane, and mini comics. That's Wizard 32. You guys stay tuned. Next week, we're going Wizard 33. 
with this Jim Bell and Catwoman costume. You see the masthead. Dave Cockrum. We, I don't even think we said the name Dave Cockrum in a Wizard episode yet, so that's going to be fun to talk about. And Mike Allred, finally, it's like the man, the myth. We've been seeing Madman stuff all over the place. We have evidence that their trading cards exist. Let's hear the guy's actual words. The only words that we got from this guy so far was about uh, signatures. Like there was like a signature <laughs> thing. Right. And, and people, he was like, yeah, I wish people would stop just bringing backing boards for me to sign. Like maybe buy my comic someday. <laughs> That's awesome. And it's going to have this gatefold two-page spread cover, which, if I remember correctly, I don't know if this was a... Well, you know what? Let's save, save it for it. next week, man. <laughs> Come back to find out. Yeah, K favors. subscribe and follow the YouTube channel. Make sure you hit the bell icon so that we can notify you whenever these new videos are available. You can find Cartoonist Kayfabe merch at our spread shop. There's a link below the video to that. Jimmy... I'm going to go count these cats, man. <laughs> Give these dudes their marching orders. Read more comics.